Hi, my name is John Flores. I'm an internist on the north side of town. I'm also chair of the North Texas Medical Society Coalition, uh, a group of over 11,000 doctors in North Texas. We've gotten together to give you unbiased information during this pandemic. I'm Dr. Beth Kasanoff piper I'm president-elect of the Dallas County Medical Society and vice chair of the North Texas Medical Society Coalition. Today, we're showing you a question and answer COVID update session hosted by Fox 4 News' Sean Rabb. We're gonna be covering uh, issues like how to identify people that are at increased risk for COVID complications. Also, we're gonna tell you how to date safely during this COVID crisis. We'll also cover, should you eat in a restaurant? Should you eat only outside? And how can you vote safely during the pandemic? All right, we'll get started here in a second. Thanks for watching. Uh, like our Facebook page. It'll keep you updated for our next Facebook Live. And thanks again. Bye-bye. All right, I am visiting with the North Texas Medical Coalition, the coalition of medical directors from various counties in uh, North Texas, and we're having a town hall COVID conversation. I want to thank all of you for being here with us today. Uh, once again, glad to see you. And, and let me just jump in and, and get started with, with my first question being about information. Okay, because we've heard so much lately in the last 72 hours about the CDC and changing directives they put out. And so let me start by, by asking, um, uh, can we trust the CDC for information? Where do we go for credible information right now? And uh, Dr. Floyd, start us off. Thanks, Sean. That's a great question to start us off. Uh, you know, it's hard to believe that uh, after six months, we're still learning about this new coronavirus, but we are. And that leads to us having to alter some courses and some guidelines. Uh, reliable sources of information, we still consider the Center for Disease Control, CDC, as one of those. Our state and local health departments uh, are also very reliable sources. Our Texas Medical Association uh, website, people can access that and gain information about guidelines and recommendations. But I really want to emphasize with this group and our North Texas Coalition that your local physician, your primary care physician, your pediatrician, family physician, internist, they are very reliable sources and they can help access uh, uh, other resources to answer your questions. So I would uh, suggest them. All right, let's stay with uh, the current news cycle and begin talking about vaccines because we've heard a lot about that, especially in the last 24 hours, uh, new uh, trials by Johnson & Johnson, uh, FDA involvement saying we're not going to rush something, we're not gonna cut corners. Um, when do you all think, and who wants to answer this, when do you think we will have a credible, reliable, trustworthy vaccine to market for the masses? Uh, Sean, I'll take a step at that one. Um, I, I think the reality is um, we'll know when we know and when it's out there. I, I think what's important to acknowledge is this is gonna be a staged rollout of, of a vaccine. Um, it's plausible that uh, a vaccine for the first wave of of patients uh, or, or, I'm sorry, individuals to receive the vaccine could be later this calendar year, early into 2021. What's important for everybody to realize is that means we're going to be targeting the highest risk individuals first. That's going to include our nursing home patients, our very high risk medical patients, and individuals who are at risk of exposure, frontline healthcare workers, hospital workers, and the like. From there, as we did with the H1N1 vaccine a number of years ago, there will be criteria that will be set out and then how to vaccine, vaccinate the masses. So I think all things considered, realistically and being pragmatic, we're looking at well into 2021, uh, possibly spring range, uh, possibly into the summer before the, uh, we have a widely available uh, vaccine or vaccines. Okay, and Dr. Flores, what should I do? Dr. Casanova talking about uh, high risk, what should I do if I live with someone who may be in a high risk category? How do I protect myself? Sure, you know, I think a lot of conditions cause you to be in high risk. If you have diabetes, you have heart disease, 
chronic kidney disease, or COPD, or what we call smoker's lung, those all put you in that high risk category. Uh, also, if you have sickle cell anemia, cancer, or if you had an organ transplant, you're in high risk. Finally, if you have obesity with a BMI over 30, you're at high risk. So it's important for you and anybody that lives with you to avoid any, any interactions with somebody outside your immediate social circle, if at all possible. If that's not possible, follow strict COVID guidelines. Wear your mask constantly, wash your hands as frequently as possible, and keep that six feet social distance. Be safe, thanks. Dr. Uh, Bandari, I have not had a COVID test. I've been healthy, I've been masked up, I've stayed away from people, but I thought about it. I've wondered if I should get one. So let me ask you, when should someone get a COVID test? That's a really great question. Um, that's a question that I think a lot of people have as to, you know, when should I get it? So there's some simple answers to that. If you have symptoms of COVID and um, like sneezing, coughing, fever, difficulty breathing, mm -hmm. that's definitely a reason to get tested. If you have been in contact with somebody who has been positive or tested positive for COVID, that's going to be another indication for you to get tested. And finally, if you've spoken to your family physician or your doc other doctor or provider, and they recommend that you need to get tested, that's another really good reason to get tested. Now, as Texans, we are really very considerate of each other. So another reason to get tested is, is the, it's the responsible thing to do. Even if you are really not going to get sick or you don't have any of those vulnerabilities that Dr. Flores just talked about, um, you may spread it to somebody on accident. And you know, we're all Texans, we're all here to be responsible and uh, take care of each other. So really getting tested is going to be the responsible thing to do. Yeah. So if I feel sick, let me ask you as a follow-up, if I feel sick, should the first thing I, I do is to go get a test or should I call my doctor? So call your doctor. So that's a really good question too. So a lot of times these um, symptoms can uh, mimic something like an allergy symptom or it could be a regular cold, right? So uh, our doctors are anticipating these questions. So call your doctor first. If you don't have a doctor, the CDC actually has a great application on their website it's called the symptom checker so you can go on there and you can put your symptoms in and it'll guide you to whether you need to call a doctor or do something even more drastic like go to the emergency room okay i'm trying to keep myself healthy i'm taking my temperature every day i've not been able to get my flu shot yet my personal physician says they're not in yet when should i get the flu shot Sean, I'll take a stab at that. Okay. Uh, now is the time to get your flu shot. Anytime now and beyond, uh, the sooner the better. Um, you know, it's also important to continue all your routine well checkups because in those well checkups, they're monitoring a number of things. They're also keeping you updated with your other immunizations. But the flu shot is definitely important. The pandemic is bad enough. The last thing we need is a twindemic with COVID and flu. So uh, get it now. And is that something that we're concerned about, Dr. Floyd, happening? This Definitely twindemic? With uh, the rate of uh, people coming back into the offices, that's picking up, but it still is down. It's decreased. And that has uh, decreased the number of people seeking and, and receiving immunizations. So okay, let's stay there. Let's stay there for a minute because we, we've seen what's happening with our school districts and, and we've seen how parents are saying, we wanna get our kids back in school. Teachers are saying, no, it's not safe. What do we do uh, as we move back into schools and, and businesses opening? So to me, you know, with children particularly, um, if they're anxious about going back to school now that they've been home for several months. Um, I think we hear the old adage, it's, quanti it's, it's quality time, not quantity time. Really it's both. So we need to spend time with our kids. We need to talk to them. We need to reassure them that uh, 
they can protect themselves, frequent hand washing, distancing, wearing masks. You know, it would be a good idea if they're really anxious, particularly the elementary school kids, to maybe contact their teacher and see if the teacher would set up a video call and talk with their child and them. Uh, that could help break the ice. It would show the child that uh, you as a parent have confidence in the teacher. Um, you know, the other thing would be to encourage the kiddos. We talk about social distancing. Really, we just mean physical distancing. Socially, we want our kiddos to interact with other kiddos. So setting up video chats with their friends, maybe even setting up a game they can play together, which uh, <laughs> my grandson can can show me how to do. I can't do it. but <laughs> And it's good for them to interact with each other. So uh, a number of those things. I think crucial to that, though, is if your child is really withdrawn or indicates any hint that they might harm themselves or do harm to others, you need professional help. Start with your primary care physician. And they can help with resources that can uh, uh, begin addressing those issues with your children. Okay, let me stay there for a minute. Dr. Casanova, let me bring you into the conversation about the stress piece, not only for my, uh, my child. How do I recognize this is happening with my kids. So in terms of uh, stress with children or stress with adults or all of the above? Well, first with the child and then with yep. me because I'm stressed out being isolated all day. It's on me. Right, right. And, and, and let's, you know, let's be honest, Sean, right now stress and anxiety abound um, in, in society. It, it, it's a reality. It's a fact. And I think we need to, to be mindful of, of how we're caring for ourselves and how we're caring for our, our children. My colleague, Dr. Floyd, uh, you know, pointed it out that if we see change in behavior in children and children are going to manifest stress, anxiety, and in some instances, depression in different ways than we will as adults. Adults tend to be more verbal about it. We will outwardly say, I'm feeling anxious. I'm depressed. I'm upset. Um, our children may not, uh, particularly our younger children, use those same words. But what they're going to do is, is they're going to demonstrate changes in behavior. As Dr. Floyd pointed out, they're going to be more withdrawn. They're going to seem to be um, enjoying their normal activities, playing on the computer, or playing with their toys, less so. Uh, there may be outbursts of anger or uh, disruptiveness. All those things are, are key to keep an eye out for. Basically, if you're a little one, is acting in ways that are very different than they normally do. Uh, my 11-year-old um, will spontaneously at times just talk about how upset she is that COVID has disrupted the world. And we talk through that. And I think that's the most important aspect is whether it's behaviors or verbalizations on the part of our children, just talk through it. Just be open, um, honest about it. I think what we have learned uh, in years of experience with children is that it doesn't actually serve them well to discount the stress. We don't want to tell them necessarily that everything's going to be okay um, in situations where it's not necessarily going to be okay by tomorrow, um, yeah. but that they're loved, they're supported, and that uh, they should be encouraged to talk to, uh, to their parents, to their loved ones, to sort of release some of that stress. So I think presence is probably one of the most important aspects for our children, and frankly, it's probably one of the more important aspects for us as adults as well. Uh, as Dr. Floyd said, you know, we early in this, we emphasize this notion of social distancing. Hindsight's always 2020. If we could hit that uh, backwards button, we would have called it physical distancing from the very beginning because we do need social interaction. We do need to rely on those stress relieving techniques that are important for us as individuals. Uh, for some, that may be quiet time. Um, it may be their faith. It, it may be exercise. Uh, but, but ensuring that we're being open and honest about it and not shirking away from it. I, I think if we fall into this notion that it doesn't exist or that it's wrong to feel stressed or anxious about it, we've just added one more layer of complexity to our lives uh, and, and setting ourselves up for disappointment. All right, I wanna to turn to uh, some more personal subject matters. Dr. Beth Casanova Piper, let's start talking about intimacy, sex and COVID. Certainly it's changed the dating scene, but what about intimacy? What, what are the guidelines? Absolutely. Uh, patients ask me all the time, you know, what do I do about dating? And I, you know, I don't want to put my life on hold because of this. So, you know, we talk about the fact that dating and sex by nature involve close contact. And it's, 
important if you're considering intimacy with someone who lives outside your household, you need to think about that really cautiously. If you have a long-standing relationship with someone, then think about creating a quarantine or bubble with that person where you really physically distance yourself from other people to protect each other. If you're thinking about starting a new relationship, ask that person questions to, so you can determine their risk to you. Are they following the safety guidelines? Have, have they been sick? Do they know of any exposures they may have? Are they doing any high risk activities or have a high risk job? Treat the discussion of COVID-19 risk like you would any other safer sex topic. So how can people lower their risk? Limit contact, the number of people that you have contact with and don't get together with someone if they have been exposed or if they feel sick at all. Avoid kissing because the virus can be spread easily through saliva and it may be unconventional, but wear a face covering over your nose and your mouth during sex. And be creative with options for intimacy that allow for physical distancing. And we're gonna live with this virus for a while, so we really have to learn how to just live safely with it. We are learning, uh, as Dr. Floyd uh, and Dr. Flores both said earlier, we're learning more about this all the time, but from what I've been able to look at, and certainly you guys have more knowledge than I do, it doesn't seem as if the virus is as easily spread through seminal and vaginal fluids, or, or do we know that, am I right in that regard? That, that's correct. So it has been isolated from semen and from feces, not ever from vaginal fluid, but we don't know of any cases that it has been transmitted person to person through any of those fluids. It's really just the close contact overall. So saliva certainly, but also respiratory droplets just from being in close contact with someone else. So wear a mask, don't kiss. Uh, I thought about this, and I don't know if this works or not, but uh, the idea that you, if you meet someone new and you're dating and you're leading up to this uh, climactic moment of intimacy, that you both go get tested and celebrate your test together. <laughs> I mean, this I is something we saw happen in previous times where we've had new diseases come onto the scene. Right, right. So I think that's reasonable. I think if the tests are available, um, especially the antigen tests possibly, which are quick, rapid tests, I think that does give you information, you know, how contagious you may be for that day in particular. Now, if someone goes and gets a test today and you've got a date with them on Saturday or Sunday, you know, yeah. that yeah. may not provide you enough protection. Exactly. Dr. Williams, uh, one of the yes, largest sir. industries in our country uh, are nail salons, the manicures, the pedicures. And what do you advise about getting a mani-pedi today? Well, thank you for asking, Sean. Basically, when it comes to mani pedis, massages, tattoo parlors, or, or the personal service industry, I think what we find is that there are certainly uh, regulations that have been rolled out by states, by municipalities, local government, um, um, and those should be followed. So, first thing is make sure if you're going someplace that they're compliant with all the local uh, guidelines that have been put into place. Number two, what I'll tell you is this is that they should have posted uh, what they're doing and that they are being compliant with CDC guidelines. A little freezing up there. Okay, we'll come back to you in a moment, Dr. Williams. We'll come back to you in a moment. Let me uh, move on for a second. We'll come back to that part in a moment. Let me ask you, um, uh, Dr. Kasanoff, about going out to eat in a restaurant. I have not been in a restaurant since probably March 10th. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll do drive-by pickup. I'll do some of that. I've, I've got trays now that I bought at Bed Bath Beyond. I, I make my little table in my truck. Uh, would you go into a restaurant and eat? I personally would not. Um, I think if you're talking about going to eat at a restaurant, I think, you know, eat outside if you can. If you can sit on a patio, if there is 
a lot of space out there and the tables can be distant, um, then that probably is fairly safe. And you want to see the tables be distant enough that you can be at least six feet from other diners. So that doesn't mean tables six feet apart. That means tables further apart so that the patrons are six feet separate from each other. Wow. Um, you know, eating outside, you know, there's more air circulating, there's less risk of the disease in that space. Um, you know, if you're going to eat inside in a restaurant, then, you know, make sure you're washing your hands frequently. And it's a good idea to keep your face mask on when you're not actively eating and drinking. So if you're conversing before the meal, just keep the mask on until you're ready to eat. But, you know, of course, the safest is still to get delivery or, or curbside pickup. Okay. Let's go back to, Dr. Williams, you're back with us. Let's go back to, uh, you were talking about the manicures and pedicures, making sure they're following all of the guidelines, making sure those guidelines are posted. And what else should we know about? Uh, basically, the last thing I think, Sean, would be is that you need to make sure that uh, when you see the other patrons and the employees, that it's obvious that they're compliant. So if you go into a place and nobody has their mask on or uh, you cannot tell that they're doing what they should be doing, I just simply go to a different place. But I think that at this point, as we've talked about the, the social interaction and being a part of life again, uh, I think for a lot of people, this is a very important interaction for them. And uh, if it can be done safely and according to the guidelines, and I believe that it can be, uh, I would encourage people to enjoy life and, uh, and to get out there and, and do it, but do it wisely. Yeah, that's good advice. Uh, Dr. Bandari, we are approaching the uh, season of election, the general election for president. And of course, many local races, the anticipation, the expectation from election judges and uh, uh, administrators is that we will have a, a record turnout. Texas is one of the few states that does not allow mail-in voting at large. So what do you recommend? How do I keep myself safe for early voting, in-person voting, uh, general election day, November 3rd, or any time between October 13th and the 30th if I go early vote? Okay, great question. And I'm really passionate about voting, so I'm so glad you asked me that question. Um, so in, in my opinion, um, if you feel safe to go to the grocery store and wait in line or go to the hardware store for some reason and, and wait in line. I think that going and waiting in line when you're voting is really no different. So we want to make sure that you follow the same uh, precautions that you would follow, say, if you're going to the grocery store. So wear your mask, stay physically distant from the person in front of you, don't touch your face when you're voting and when you get back into the car make sure you use your hand sanitizer and then take your mask off so if you can vote that way i would highly suggest you do that as long as you follow those precautions and remember we have those early voting days from the 13th of october through the 31st so what does that mean that means that you can again go vote at a time when there's not going to be a large number of people there i uh, think about when you go to the grocery store to pick up milk you don't want to go uh, right at lunch hour you don't want to go right after work like after five o'clock so pick times of the day that are going to be less busy now if you happen to be one of those people that have those vulnerabilities like the heart problems diabetes, high blood pressure, things that put you at higher risk for complications from COVID, you can opt for that mail-in ballot. So there are four reasons why you can have, uh, you can actually vote by mail. So number one is if you're 65 years or older. Number two is if you have a disability. Number three is if you're not going to be in the county during election time. Uh, number four is if, if you're in jail. So if you qualify for any of those four reasons, then you can apply. Actually, I went online and I looked at the application. It's a very simple application. You just tick off what you think makes you qualify for that mail-in ballot and you send it in and then you'll get that mail-in ballot vote and then go ahead and do that. Um, I think it's really important to vote. So even, you know, either you go in early and you go in yourself or you can do that mail-in ballot. Either which way, please go out and vote. Very good. Uh, Dr. 
let's see, who do I want to ask this question to? Uh, I'm going to come back to you, Dr. Williams. Yes. Uh, we've seen high school football programs put on hold, college football programs, some in play, some not. If you're a parent and you have a child whose future might depend on getting in front of college coaches to get a scholarship and you're torn between them, what is the best advice you give about letting your child play football, your daughter participate in basketball or volleyball or football, any kind of contact athletics in high school at the moment? Well, I think the best advice is going to be this, is that if that plays a significant role in the identity, the value, the uh, purpose uh, for your child, for their progress into the future, for scholarships, for different things like that, then I think that it's always a matter of weighing the risk versus the benefit of what they're doing. So in this particular case, uh, I am a big advocate for live life, but live it safely and wisely. So use personal protective equipment, check the university or the school or the setting and see if they are following the guidelines. Uh, make sure that it's the safest environment that you can get for them. The unfortunate truth is, as a, as a father of six, perfect environment and there is no perfect safety. But in the end, I think that we need to be very careful about not allowing our children to live life and to do their best because of fear. So in the end, okay. do it, do it wisely, use correct protection, and make sure that you communicate with the coaching staff and the school where they may be going. Good answer. You know, Sean, Dr. Flores, uh, let me add, did someone have, want to add something to yeah, that? Yeah, Sean, uh, this is Dr. Kasson. I was just going to yes. add to Dr. Williams' uh, comments on the sports because I think there's, there's another theme that whether it's participation in sports or other activities, it's also important to acknowledge is um, what is the risk factor for that family unit? So if we have a child in the household, young adult, um, who's interested in participating in activities, or we ourselves are interested in going to that nail salon for the Manny Petty, for example. Um, who else do we live with? Do we live with high risk individuals? So when we do that personal risk assessment weighted against the values and desire assessment, we also need to think of who are we uh, exposed to? Who are we potentially exposing within our household? Right. So again, fully agree with Dr. Williams' um, points and, and also that added ingredient of who's with us under our roof. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, I didn't play football back in the day in high school, but I was on the chess team. And when you got down, if you advanced to the tournament to the final match, I mean, you're sitting here with the, another kid from another school, but all these other kids have gathered around to watch the final match. And there's no, no social distance, distancing around the chessboard either. <laughs> So these are the times that try us, definitely. Uh, Dr. Flores, you're the chairman of this medical coalition, so let me ask you this question. We've seen the positivity rate in Texas, now lower than it's been since, well, pretty much since this thing began. Well, cases seem to be declining, uh, certainly hospitalizations, uh, deaths seem to be declining. As we are now uh, into fall, into autumn, should we anticipate if we relax what we're doing, if we relax what we're doing with masking and um, let's call it physical distancing, not social distancing. I kind of like that term better. Uh, if we're not careful, can we have a big resurgence here in the fall and winter? Yeah, I think that's really important to realize the only reason we're having these numbers is because we're doing masking, you know, all through uh, the first mandate we had to stay home, you know, shelter at home, we saw cases go down. But then we opened up and what happened? We saw cases skyrocket. You know, we had holidays and people did the wrong thing. They didn't do the, the social, the precautions like we've told them and cases went up and cases went up. And then we had a change in the summer, you know, the, the governor mandated masking and we started to see cases go down. But at the same time, they're not down to where they were in the spring. So if we don't do the right thing in the, in the coming months, we're gonna have probably see resurgence. And that's what concerns a lot of us. That's what we're doing, what we're doing. Uh, wearing the mask, set, staying social distant, washing your hands, and now getting your flu shot. All these things are very important. All right, my friends, I thank you very much for your time today. Appreciate the valuable information that you're sharing. And let's beat COVID. <laughs>